Yeah. So what, what do you see is the challenges for these floating cities in general and especially for Singapore? For us to adapt, I mean, to build a floating, you know, waterfront. I mean, it very much depends um, what we define as a floating city. That's, that's mm. one of the problems that I came across all the time um, over right. the course of um, decades since the 1960s. Mm. I mean, there are some people who imagine this to be something like 50,000 people with a cathedral floating on the ocean somewhere, which is uh, maybe a bit unrealistic. But um, if we scale up, so to speak, from what mainly the um, offshore industry has created, um, then you can actually um, call some of the um, offshore oil complexes or certain other buildings um, floating settlements, floating villages, and so on. I mean, it's also related to the question, um, how many people do you need to have a city? And another issue is also, if you actually need to have people living there permanently. So um, the um, one, of, one of the issues I briefly want to talk about is the um, issue of the um, functional separation mm -hmm. of um, city districts. So one of the criticisms that Tanga received and which was very serious is that he basically um, proposed a structure that would be split into residential quarters, commercial quarters, industrial quarters, and a gigantic highway that connected all of them. So you would not be able to walk, for example, to your working place. You would also not get without a car to a supermarket and so on. So um, this is totally different than the natural growth of a city, so to speak. So this is something that Fuller to a certain degree with um, a more focused modularization wanted to deal with. But um, in the long run, um, even if you have only, so to speak, um, 5,000 people living on some floating settlement and you um, then from the beginning um, tell them how many supermarkets they are supposed to have. Um, this is also a very much top-down um, centralized um, design approach. So one of the conditions, I think, um, to come to your um, question and um, how this can all develop in the future is um, not only very strong modularization, but also giving people the maximum freedom to actually um, put onto platforms what they really want. And if they want to have um, three supermarkets, um, just to give you the example, instead of one, um, because they don't like the idea of a um, monopoly, um, there needs to be um, space and there also needs to be um, a possibility to um, change um, existing structures um, in a way that um, this can be implemented in an easy way. So um, yeah. this is always the um, problem here. Um, another issue that I briefly want to talk about is um, basically um, starting in, this, in, in a certain way with um, first principles and to ask really um, if you want to build a floating city, what is really the main difference if you build a settlement offshore to a settlement um, onshore? What can you really do there that cannot be done onshore? And I mean, um, some of the points um, that I briefly touched um, are the mobility issue. This is more sustainable um, in the sense that um, if implemented in the correct way, um, buildings can be moved around and therefore do not need to be demolished. Um, there's also less of a um, permanent um, impact, even though there are issues like, like um, shadow casting and so on. Um, but altogether, um, in that sense, it's more sus sustainable um, than land reclamation. So you don't change this uh, space um, landscape for the future generations. And I think um, one of the main issues um, for many, many politicians, at least in certain countries, is um, that it's easier to um, generate um, solar power. So that's, that's I think, one of the um, proposals um, that um, can go together with ideas for um, floating settlements, be that um, floating solar panels in not too rough waters or be that um, roof installed um, solar panels um, for, for a variety of um, environmental um, reasons. I don't mean in the sense of environmental protection, but in the sense of um, the conditions offshore um, that um, make it easier to um, produce um, solar energy and also to certain degree um, to use um, the availability of um, 
offshore wind turbines. Mm -hmm. So, um, yep. so, yeah. so in terms of the the Tangis definitions of floating or amphibious dwelling, do they mean floating structures or anything that use this ocean space for development? So um, in Tanga's case, um, it was more amphibious or elevated. So All right. this elevation basically meant that, um, I mean, the water level would go up and down, but um, would not reach um, the um, settlements on top of the piers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, we are talking here about an idea um, that at the extreme um, points um, was supposed to elevate um, buildings uh, more than 50 meter above mm -hmm. um, the um, bay level. Um, I mean, th this was all, as mentioned, to a certain degree also for, for um, the media and so on. But um, I mean, some of the long-term impacts are, for example, I mean, if you walk around in um, Japan, you can see, um, and if you actually read um, some history books that soon afterwards actually um, elevated um, highways were introduced. I mean, not, 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 not to the degree that um, Tanga wanted and also not um, really over Tokyo Bay. I mean, there are some connections and so on, but um, there are um, quite a number of um, elevated highways in Tokyo to solve this um, urban congestion and transportation problem. And um, for Fuller, um, it had to be floating. Mm -hmm. It started basically, I mean, with this um, idea um, from um, Matsutaro um, Shoriki to have this um, really big building looked into and Fuller was concerned about the um, stability. I mean, um, the, the, the question if this really can be built, um, they did some investigations and so on. It would be extremely, extremely um, expensive as you can imagine. And you had to deal with um, high altitude winds and so on. So he came to the conclusion um, in terms of earthquakes, um, that's not a good idea. Um, if, this, if you have a big earthquake mm -hmm. in Japan, um, better build something um, on the bay. And he also argued that if you want to build other tetrahedral like floating structures, um, then dig an artificial lake and place them in this artificial lake and not somewhere onshore. So, and for Kikutaki, he was also very much focused on floating structures. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, we have one question. Uh, where do you think within the APEC region would be most ready to develop a floating city? Here yeah, again, I mean, it largely depends on the um, question of um, regulations and so on, um, which mm -hmm. government actually could be interested in doing that. And um, I mean, the environmental um, factors um, and conditions should also be taken into consideration. I mean, um, since, since um, yeah, the, the um, study done by um, Fuller, um, who already was concerned with um, hurricanes or here, uh, more, more typhoons, um, um, I mean, if, if you have such an area that um, is affected by very strong winds, um, that's maybe not the best um, place to try some prototypes. I mean, maybe in the long run, but not for the first one, um, if you don't want to have it um, crash in some way. And otherwise, um, I mean, I could also go into details here um, why um, Fuller um, failed and then mention, um, for example, if you remember this um, seasteading um, project in Tahiti, um, right. this was almost exactly what was criticized um, regarding um, Fuller's idea. Don't, don't try to build your own um, kind of um, exclusive um, political zone. And um, also don't try to move anything into um, waters that are not controlled by state. And don't try to get around state regulations. Also, if you remember this um, other seasteading story mm -hmm. of um, Phuket, um, the, the mm -hmm. Um, American um, Thai couple. Um, that, that's also the same story. And um, um, if you remember, maybe um, Gaylord Nelson, who's the founder of um, or co-founder of um, Earth Day, he actually wrote an article that was printed in the congressional um, record of the United States Congress that people Fuller basically had this idea to build floating cities that could be moved into international waters and then do there what they want. And that, <laughs> that's something you cannot allow at all. So um, really make sure that the state is with you. Otherwise, um, this ends in a disaster, I think. Um, right. So maybe a follow up from these questions from uh, Secretary John Rina and Mars. So how do you see the future of floating cities as a government business or private investing? So my, my 
take on that is that, um, I mean, that there are a number of um, different um, ideas how this could be implemented that I read in books. My, my personal take is that we probably um, see um, an increase in industrial um, structures ranging from um, solar energy, um, offshore wind turbines, which, which are already in the process of being built. Um, certainly also more and bigger um, mariculture facilities and so on. And then um, maybe similar to the offshore industry, um, the slow development of accommodation places, which at the same time um, maybe will not as important anymore because probably also um, with um, large scale internet um, coverage, um, there will probably be a more automation, um, be that um, underwater drones or flying drones and so on um, that will be implemented there. So um, that's a kind of industrialization based uh, floating city where you have basically an um, industrial focus and you don't focus really much on um, residential quarters. And then at the same time, um, in the long run, I also think that um, coastal cities will increasingly um, build or support the um, construction of um, floating homes um, and so on. So in that sense, you, you probably don't have the um, floating city that is in some ways um, independent um, or not really um, related to um, um, an onshore economy um, very soon. So because it's basically not really essential in view of um, a stronger um, focus of um, coastal cities on um, floating mm -hmm. um, structures and a more industrial um, focus on something that doesn't need too many people's people living there. Yeah. Okay. But I, I might be wrong in this regard. Okay, so we have one question from uh, Nachu. Uh, what's the key reason uh, floating cities idea did not really take up? Because I read from one of your, in your paper with the same title, um, this uh, Shoriki says that it's cost in the 1970s, but how about now? Are we ready for floating city? Is the cost already ready to be economical? <laughs> I, I, I think um, today it would be possible. So um, it obviously de depends on how you actually um, um, also um, support it with um, certain um, industrial um, facilities um, to actually um, generate um, some income and um, justify the overall um, costs for implementation. Um, but um, yeah, to, just to give a few reasons um, why this um, didn't really um, take up. I mean, I mentioned um, briefly um, the issue that um, the, the, these ideas um, from um, Tanga and Fuller were not really um, practical um, because they had this um, strong separation of um, different functions. So um, it was not comfortable to live there basically for people, mm -hmm. um, similar to um, the problems that many artificially designed um, onshore cities have. And there's a large literature and um, lots of complaints um, starting with um, Jane Jacobs and so on in the 1960s, how you actually need to build a city that you have in, for example, nice uh, nightlife um, where you don't depend on a um, car and so on, um, and also um, have more security in the sense that you don't have any quarters that are almost empty um, after it gets dark, um, like for example, industrial quarter um, where nobody lives and so on. I mean, this separation um, of spaces um, and um, functions goes back largely to the 19th century when you didn't want to have um, residential quarters next to pollution producing industrial quarters, but it's not really relevant anymore when people are basically engaged largely in um, tertiary um, sectors um, and um, commercial activities where you can mix this up. Um, I also mentioned this concern that um, people would move floating um, structures in into spaces that are not controlled by the government and engage in um, all sorts of um, practices there, which started, I think, in the United States with, with um, gambling, for example. Um, outside the um, territorial waters and so on. But um, there was also then this concern for environmental um, pollution. Um, there's also um, a variety of concerns that basically um, 
this is too much techno optimism that that's now a cultural issue and um for example um lewis mumford um important urban studies person um wrote this article on um, pyramids as the first mega machines basically with which pharaohs controlled the population by making them engage in a stupid construction project um that basically um kept them occupied and in some ways um, he also compared this for example to the um Apollo pro program basically which um, was nice for a couple of people who then walked around on the moon but um, almost everybody else just had to pay for it and mm -hmm. to a certain degree also applied this to um, Fuller's idea um, since I mean that the shape of Fuller's uh, structure this um, almost pyramid like um, shape was also not helpful if your um, criticism basically starts with um, ancient Egyptian um, pyramids um, that are seen basically as this um, kind of um, technology driven mm -hmm. control function. Um, there was also a reduced interest in ecologically autonomous um, structures, um, which, which is now getting important. I mean, um, it's not only about, um, I think, rising sea level. That's obviously a concern. Mm -hmm. But if you have intensifying um, floods and people really live in a disaster area and are hit by a disaster, which is maybe not necessarily happening in um, countries like um, Singapore or the um, United States and so on, but um, can happen in um, island countries, um, Jamaica, for example, then um, if you actually have a more ecologically autonomous structure with um, floating solar panels or with um, rooftop installed solar panels, you can actually produce energy um, while you are on your floating house for hours or days until somebody um, saves you or until the water retreats and you don't have to leave your house because most likely somebody comes and steals all your things while you're away. So um, in that sense, you can also, um, if you have um, solar energy, um, produce your own water or you can um, um, collect water um, on the rooftop and so on. Um, so that's also something that I think is getting more important when we think through the implications of climate change, rising sea levels, um, flood disasters and so on. And one mm -hmm. last point, um, Fuller was also just not going on with this project anymore because he became occupied with other things. Mm -hmm. So you, you can also mm -hmm. say that he just had had other ideas um, in this um, regard. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So in the past, Japan opted for land reclamation, right? So now with the rise of uh, seawater level, you see that this floating city concept will be they will be more acceptable to this kind of concept. And do you think that this floating city is effective in the protections of rising sea water level? I mean, in terms of protecting um, against rising sea level, um, I think almost everything that um, floats um, is helpful. And it's also more comfortable for people than elevated buildings. When we talk about um, older people, um, they either need an elevator or they need um, stairs uh, if you really elevate um, a structure and um, I mean the elevator um, if you have a flood um, isn't really helpful um, the stairs are not really um, nice for all the people to walk every day um, so um, floating in that sense is um, certainly the uh, better approach um, here again um, the question is I think the um, size that's uh, certainly something I, I, I can imagine more that um, many people will build individual floating homes or maybe small clusters of them. If this moves into a bigger structure, um, I can also imagine that, but it certainly takes um, longer because I mean, um, for people, um, I mean, um, there are also um, issues like, um, privacy um, and also um, I think for a long time um, better connections to onshore um, infrastructures and so on. So there's this maybe takeoff point in time um, where you actually um, can have a um, city that um, can sustain itself but um, it would probably um, still be based uh, somewhere between an um, onshore city and some floating industrial combine. So, um, and I mean, if this gets really implemented by the um, government, I think it's to, to a certain degree, it's a question of um, explaining to um, government officials what the benefits are. And this can take a very long time. I don't want to go into details, but I mean, um, in, in Germany and um, other countries, we recently had these um, floodings. And I mean, these floodings 
they happen since, I mean, you can find this online easily, the, all the sources since the late Middle Ages. Everybody knows this is an area that gets flooded every couple of years. The question is just how strong are these floods? But I mean, um, politicians came to the conclusion we can remove all the um, public um, sirens. We don't need to send any text messages to people and so on. So sometimes you really wonder what is going on there. Um, Okay. Okay. We have one question from Prof. Allen. Um, what is the more likely driver of floating cities, humanitarian crisis or voluntary migration? Mm, my, my, my take, I'm, I'm talking here as a historian, is um, I think um, humanitarian um, crisis or at least um, preparations um, to accommodate um, sea level rise. And um, or to, to adapt to um, sea level rise and um, the related um, crisis, whereas voluntary migration, um, in theory, um, sounds good, but uh, the question is also um, a lot of states um, historically um, want to control where you're actually going to, um, or want to control um, what you may be doing on such a place. I mean, I already uh, mentioned the um, issue concerning um, Fuller and not moving um, any structure um, into waters not controlled by a state and so on. Um, but um, I mean, Fuller explicitly said that he actually um, wanted to liberate people from governmental oppression and um, governments not allowing people to move where they want to move to. But at the same point in time in um, the 1960s, uh, think about the um, German Democratic um, Republic and the construction of the Berlin Wall or think about North Korea and so on and the minefields and so on. So you, you find quite a lot of um, countries and these are the countries where people most likely would like to migrate that will not allow people to migrate or will make it very, very difficult for them. Whereas people um, in a lot of other places, um, I mean, yeah, you have market libertarians and so on who would um, probably um, do some kind of seasteading project, but um, that, that's a very small number of um, people and in terms of a lobby group maybe also not the strongest um, so i think this voluntary migration idea is good in theory but um, will not have the uh, real driving force at the end of the day okay so uh, there is no more questions from the chat room any other questions If no, probably we can stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Steven, for giving this presentation. So I'd like to thank everyone once again for attending this webinar. And please do look out at our society web page for future activities. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steven. Thank you.